Now this one is going to be both a module about a certain logical fallacy and a book recommendation. There is an unfortunate human tendency when presented with a puzzling observation to accept the first explanation or seeming explanation that happens along. A good example of this occurs when one person asks, why does the sun rise? And another responds, oh, it is being pulled across the sky by a magical horse, or it, or it is being, pulled across, being rolled across the sky by a giant magical beetle. Where did life come from? God made it. A much more grievous example is examined by UCLA geography professor Jared Diamond in his book, Guns, Germs, and Steel. This book examines why, across the ages, some civilizations have developed further and more rapidly than others. Let me take a moment to say that I highly recommend this book. It's kind of a heavy read, but if you can find the time for it, it's worth it. You see, many a cursory examination of history shows us that it was European civilizations that conquered Africa and the Americas, and not the other way around. So it has often been asked why in the world this should be the case. There are those who are very quick to respond to this by simply saying that Europeans are just more intelligent than Africans and Native Americans. Now, there may have been a time when no explanation received more evidentiary support than this one, but even then, this was far from adequate grounds to accept this so-called explanation, given the fact that it accounts for only one observation. Let's say that we have a list of 100 related yet randomly selected empirical observations. Ah, but wait a minute. Let me take a moment to clarify that I'm using the word empirical in the scientific sense of the word, not the philosophical sense. So what's the difference? In the philosophical sense, empirical is contrasted with rational. Empiricism accounts for everything that can be directly observed, perceived with the senses, while rationalism accounts for everything that can be logically concluded or inferred from that which can be observed. In the philosophical sense, empirical is a synonym for observable, while rational is a synonym for extrapolable. In the scientific sense, on the other hand, empirical is contrasted with anecdotal. Here we have a slightly different concept with the same name. Anecdotal evidence is evidence based on anecdote. When one points out that two characteristics go together or coincide in one particular case, that's an anecdote. If that anecdote is documented in a demonstrable or independently verifiable manner, then we have a piece of anecdotal evidence. Empirical evidence, on the other hand, conducts a proper sample to determine what percentage of the time two characteristics coincide, or what percentage of the time two variables change in unison. Empirical evidence, in the scientific sense of the word, is necessary in order to establish whether any correlations exist. If two variables tend to increase in unison, or decrease in unison, then we have a positive correlation. If, on the other hand, increases in one tend to coincide with decreases in the other, or vice versa, then we have a negative correlation. This is the scientific sense of the word empirical. This is the sense I'm using here. So summing it up, empirical evidence in the scientific sense is evidence which makes correlations empirical in the philosophical sense. So let's go back to that list of 100 related yet randomly selected empirical observations. Beginning with the first, if we are setting out to explain them, it's a good idea to speculate until we have maybe five or six explanations, which at this point are called hypotheses. Then the best thing for us to do is to keep each hypothesis in mind while we examine the second observation. The hypotheses which explain the second as well are strengthened, are strengthened and supported by the act. Those which don't are weakened unless they can be modified so that they still explain both observations. This we repeat with each subsequent observation, modifying each hypothesis as necessary until one has been modified to the point that it enables us to predict observations which are on the list but which we haven't examined yet. When these predictions can be made with testable, measurable accuracy to any extent whatsoever, leaving the door wide open for directed, testable speculation, then we have a school of thought, or in scientific and academic terms, a theory. When a given explanation enables you to make these predictions with such a high degree of accuracy that the prospect of that explanation being mistaken would be the greater miracle, the greater scientific revolution, then we have a fact. Not until we reach this point. It's still a theory, but it's also a fact. In science, these are compatible concepts. The question of different civilizations developing at different speeds, and thus European civilizations, conquering African and Native American civilizations, is one observation for which many possible explanations can be arrived at through speculation. If this is the only piece of evidence one is going to use to support this conclusion, or perhaps only this and a bare handful of others, then what we have is the fallacy of hasty generalization also known as the fallacy of insufficient statistics. That is, it reaches an inductive generalization based on the briefest, laziest of assessments 
and far from sufficient evidence. One could also call this conclusion the fallacy of unwarranted assumption, which I have explained previously in this series, since it also makes the assumption that the intelligence of the three major ethnic groups in question is the only variable that had any bearing on this. But of course such is clearly not the case. Jared Diamond, in this book, takes the long road, taking the time to examine as exhaustive a list of related cultural observations as can be reasonably accommodated in just a few hundred pages. Basically, he goes well out of his way, making a very noble and successful effort to avoid this particular fallacy. The rest of this particular video, I am going to spend expounding on the book. If you don't feel like sitting through that, then by all means click away now. Let's say that we have two neighboring civilizations, A and B, and each at this point relies on a nomadic way of life. But then after a few centuries, one begins to experiment with agriculture. What does that entail? Agriculture depends on two key practices. First, in any undeveloped region, only about 10% of the vegetation is going to provide some manner of sustenance that human beings can digest. In agriculture, one tears out the other 90% and replaces it with the plants that previously composed that 10, enabling one's civilization to draw 10 times as much sustenance from the same patch of land. Second, in agriculture, one domesticates plants, enabling one to apply artificial selection to their reproduction. This makes it possible to direct the development of those crops in ways that further support the civilization growing them. So, if a civilization relies on nomadic living, every able-bodied member of that civilization must participate in the search for food in order for that civilization to sustain itself. If, on the other hand, it begins to make the transition to agriculture, as happened in the agricultural revolution about 10,000 years ago, suddenly it is able to produce so much food that a large portion of its people don't need to participate in that and can begin to develop their skills and expertise in other specializations, like soldiering. Therefore, an agricultural civilization is much more able to sustain an army than a nomadic one. This, however, is not a key difference.